Right, currently at day setting up our conversation. Let's quickly begin. We have full house here in Abuja and, of course, uh, in our outside uh, stations. Let me quickly introduce Dr. Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu, who is wife of the Kebi State Governor. She's a pediatrician and founder of Nigerian NGO Medicaid Cancer. We'd like to welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria, Excellency. Thank you for inviting me again. <laughs> and also here with us in the city is Dr. Belu Abubakar Mohammed. Uh, a very good friend of ours, Chief Consultant, Clinical and Radiation Oncologist, National Hospital here in Abuja. Thank you, Doctor, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, joining us also to shed more light on the issue of breast cancer, we have Dachung, Honorable Dachung <coughs> Musa Bagos. He's a member of the House of Representatives representing George Southeast Federal Constituency, Plateau State. Thank you, Honorable Member. For uh, good morning. Good morning, Nigeria. All right. Uh, all right, now we have uh, two other guests who will be joining us uh, via Skype for this conversation uh, from Akura, the Ondo State Capital. I uh, would like to welcome Mrs. Betty Anyao Akeredolo. She's wife of the Ondo State Governor. And she's founder of Breast Cancer Association of Nigeria. Uh, Your Excellency, pleasure to have you with us on the program this morning. And also joining us via Skype for this conversation from uh, Birmingham City University in the United Kingdom is Ronsi Chidebe, Executive Director, Project Pink Blue. Uh, Chidebe, pleasure to have you with us on the program as well. Thank you so much. It's really amazing to be here. All right. Uh, well, we hope, hopefully we'll be joined by another guest uh, you know, in, in, the, in the course of, of, of the conversation. Our yeah. principal focus is, is on breast cancer, but it's always valuable uh, to have an overview of, of what cancer is all about uh, and how it manifests and the various types that you had before we now zero in on, on breast cancer. Let's bring in Dr. Bello. Mohammed, cancer, what is it? And why is it killing people all over the world, including Nigeria? Okay, so um, the word cancer actually um, simply means an uncontrolled replication of cells in the body. We do know that the body sheds cells, new cells are formed, new, uh, some are dying and so on. And this is controlled by genes in the body. By the time you have what is called mutations, and those genes can no longer control those process of dying, they become immortal. So the cells become immortal. So in other words, cancer simply means immortal cells. So when they develop, they become immortal, they develop continuously, they form tumors, and they have the ability to spread. Okay, so that means you can have cancer in literally every organ of the body. And cancer can affect literally everyone from a child to an old person. And we do know that there are three most important cancers because of their high prevalence. Breast cancer is one of them, and cervical cancer and prostate cancer in men. Okay, and breast cancer, as it were, is the most, imp is the most important cancer because it afflicts more people on earth, including Nigeria. In other words, is the number one cancer, followed by cervical cancer in Nigeria. And then, of course, the third one is the prostate cancer in men. Um, breast cancer is so important in the sense that there are so many things that you can do, actually, to kind of have a preventive measure, you know, by looking at the risk factors. Because we do know a lot of risk factors that can be prevented to prevent breast cancer. At the same time, cervical cancer is one disease that can actually be prevented completely. In other words, you can eliminate it completely, 100%. That's with specific to cervical cancer or all cancers? For specifically for cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. It can be eliminated because we do know the causative agent of the cervical cancer, the human papilloma virus, and there is a vaccine that if given over time, you will be able to eliminate that virus. Mm. So it's something that can actually be prevented. At the okay. same time, you can also detect the precancerous condition. In other words, before the cancer develops, 
of cervical cancer, you will be able to detect it, you will be able to uh, institutionalize screening programs. Okay. Dr. Bell, since we're looking at specifically breast cancer, right. I'd like for you to tell us why the female breast or why the breast is a choice area for those mutating cells. Now, the breast is created in such a way that it performs several, uh, some functions. And that function is basically controlled by hormones. The most important one is the estrogen. So the estrogen has effect on the breast in terms of development and so on and so forth. So certain things do happen. If, for instance, a woman has uncontrolled challenge of the estrogen on the breast over a very long period of time, mm -hmm. there are chances that she could develop breast cancer. That is why we said the most important risk factor for developing breast cancer is being a woman because that is the female um, uh, hormone, okay, the estrogen. Now, if a woman is breastfeeding, the estrogen level tends to go down, okay, because the prolactin counteracts the effect of the estrogen and by so doing she is protecting herself against breast cancer okay so women that don't breastfeed tend to have higher level of breast cancer as compared to those that have had you know uh, breastfeeding um, uh, um, situations right so <clears throat> dr billow is cancer a disease of the modern age or is it an ancient affliction which continues into the current times? So since we know most of the risk factors, some are actually increasing, but it's an old, very old disease. Okay, so it's not something that is new, but because of the awareness that we have now and because of the modern facilities, we tend to see more cancers. It's not like they have not existed. They have always existed. But because of modern awareness and lifestyle changes that are risk factors, we tend to have more cancers than we used to have before. But it's an old disease that has existed since the beginning of time. But now, because of our lifestyle changes, smoking, alcohol consumption, um, sedentary life, you know, lack of exercises, and so on and so forth, the development of cancer is much higher. Mm. Okay, Kinsley, let, let me just bring Her Excellency. Uh, she's a pediatrician, so would uh, know much about you know these women issues. Because Dr. Bello talked about the fact that you know, if you cease breastfeeding you know, and there are chances of the estrogen, you know, becoming more and more uncontrolled. W what, is, what is the connection between when the woman stops her monthly, you know, cycle and the development of breast cancer, like menopause and, you know, development of breast cancer? Um, well, the, it's very simple, really. The tendency to develop breast cancer increases with age. Age, increasing age, is another risk factor. Um, young girls get breast cancer, but the age at which breast cancer develops, um, for us here in sub-Saharan Africa, it starts from about 40, sometimes we say 35, but from the age of 45 upwards, that is the age that breast cancer develops. So with increasing age, when the estrogen, when it's getting less, that is when you get to have breast cancer more. So increasing age is the age at, uh, is a risk, high risk factor for breast cancer. Well, from a layman's point of view, uh, and considering the function of the breast, even though we had said earlier, uh, and I made that claim, and the experts are here to correct us that every human being is susceptible to breast cancer, in other words, man and woman. Yeah. But uh, considering the special function of, of the breast in a woman, does the size of the breast act as a factor, uh, whether in the estrogen level and the mammary function, whether it can <coughs> excuse me, contribute to no, the risk exactly. of cancer? No. Okay, so not exactly. <laughs> But we do know that uh, fat cells <coughs> tend to have a lot of estrogen um, hormones. 
So if you are really fat, that's why we say obesity is also a risk factor for development of breast cancer. So we know that the more obese you are, the more likely that you'll have a bigger breast. So, but the real thing is that it's actually the obesity, not the size, the size of the of breast, breast, that determines that. Now let's not forget that one percent yeah. of men also develop breast cancer. Yes. I'm wondering why Kinsley had to ask the question about the size yeah. of the breast. No, because no, no, we're talking about it, that first of all, uh, in terms of anatomy, oh. the uh, the breast has fatty tissues. Uh, whether those tissues are okay. deposits or otherwise, okay. uh, again, the experts are here to tell us that it's the interplay of fat deposits and so on and so forth. All that over go, the body, uh, not all over, just the breast. Not just the breast. Yes, uh, okay. obesity. Okay, but, but to the extent that obesity... Obesity is a risk factor. <coughs> general anatomical obesity. Yes, for developing cancer including breast cancer. Including breast cancer. Mm -hmm. All right, w w what do we know? Um, sorry, please, Claire. <coughs> I, I have to... <coughs> it's like I'm coming down with you, a cold, but, but, but it's, it's a Friday, so uh, thankfully we should be out of this uh, shortly. <laughs> but, but, but in terms of the prevalence of breast cancer in Nigeria, and from the perspective from which you have operated, what do you know? Uh, about the prevalence of, of, of breast cancer and indeed whether uh, those who have it know that in fact they have it? Well, that is one of the major issues that we have as from the civil society point of view. It is the, we know that it's one of the most prevalent, it is the most prevalent breast can cancer in the world. We know that it is very prevalent in Nigeria, but our data, our statistics are poor and to have the actual numbers are always poor. We're always saying uh, 250,000 cases are detected every year. And, um, but we know that it is more because most of the people that develop it do not even know that they have it and they come to the hospital late. Although with increasing awareness, people know the word cancer now, they know that they have something wrong with their breast. It's just to get them to come to the hospital at the right stages. Um, we can testify that they're now coming at earlier stages, stage two, stage three, as opposed to before. Stage one and two are even being picked up earlier now, as opposed to before when they used to come to the hospital at a later stage four, mm -hmm. when they're fungating, especially in my part of the country, which is Kebi State and the Northwest area, where you most women do not agree that this is a treatable disease or something that they can go to the hospital and get a uh, cure for. They would rather go to traditional local healers and they use <laughs> local portions on it until... I can tell you that it's, um, it's not just peculiar to Kebi. No, it's, it's not. It's a, general, it's, it's a general, it's a general yeah, thing. Perception. It's a cultural yes, it's, perception. It's a general perception. Uh, to just to again you know, emphasize that we do have, of course, our other guests uh, that should, that it's jo are joining us from you know Bahamut City and Akure, and of course we have the honourable <coughs> member here. Uh, let me b before I bring in our guest that uh, uh, who is joining us from the UK. I'd, I'd like for Dr. Bello um, to tell us. We, we will join UK in a short while. Uh, but Dr. Bello, what do we what do we know um, about you know, cancer, what stands out in, in our treatment management of cancer in Nigeria in terms of morbidity, in terms of uh, mortality and, and care? So just like Her Excellency was mentioning that uh, most of our patients are not aware, so they present late. So late presentation, late presentation and late presentation is the keyword in Nigeria and indeed in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, beyond the late presentation, there are no institutionalized screening programs in the country. In other words, um, it's only NGOs like the Medicaid Cancer Foundation and the one that is being done by the uh, Excellency of Niger State, Ondo State, and so on and so forth. So they are really in, in, in bits and pieces. Uh, in most of developed countries, you have an institutionalized screening program. By the time a woman reaches the age of 40, somebody will be knocking at her door with a bouquet of flower, 
and telling her come for your mammogram screening. Hmm. And there is a lot of awareness of breast self-examination, which is taught literally in all schools, in all hospitals, and so on and so forth. So that is also like, when you look at the treatments, it's something that is really, really far, far lacking. It's, uh, it's like the country is not really ready. Um, you'll be surprised to realize that in this country, by World Health Organization standard, we require 180 radiotherapy machines. We have just about five that are functional. We require at least 3,000 radiation oncologists for a population of 180 million. We have 70, seven, zero. So you can understand. And out of that 70, only about 20% have access to radiotherapy machines uh, to work effectively and so on and so forth. As I'm talking to you, the National Hospital has two radiotherapy machines and you need therapy radiographers to operate them. We are looking for therapy radiographers. They are not even available in the country. So we have to start looking elsewhere. So you can understand that it is a gamut of problems. We are not literally ready for the epidemic that we have of especially breast cancer. Okay, uh, Dr. Bello, thank you very much. Oh, you raised a number of um, management uh, issues with regard to breast cancer. I will return to those points. Uh, Claire indicated we're going over to the UK to join Ronsi Chidebe, as Executive Director of uh, Project uh, Pink Blue, uh, of course, which deals with, uh, with uh, cancer issues. Now, uh, Ronsi, uh, give us a sense of what your uh, NGO has apprehended with regard to the incidence of breast cancer in Nigeria and how uh, we are responding uh, to uh, the public health issue. Very much. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation. Yeah. So, but I, I just uh, have to really mention that uh, one major challenge that. Uh, that uh, we are currently having, just as Dr. Bello and others has mentioned, is about late detection of um, breast cancer in specific, yeah. But I would love to give a little background about how this, how we get to where we are today uh, as, as a country, I mean Nigeria as a country, and also looking at it from the South, Sub-Saharan Africa perspective. Um, if you think, for instance, in Nigeria, you realize like, um, about nine years ago, our life expectancy in Nigeria is just about um, you know, 50 years, right? 50.8 years, according to World Bank. And in 2019 now, our life expectancy is 54.4%. That is 0 0.58 increment. It means we are doing well in the area of infectious disease. But well, the challenge is that when most people really survive from this infectious disease, that is a communicable disease, they fall back to having non-communicable diseases like cancer, like breast cancer, like liver cancer, cervical cancer, and all forms of cancer. So this is pulling a very big challenge to us, also coupled with innovations that we are having globally now, especially in the area of diagnosis, which is not been done before. Another very important point, again, is that many Africans, and indeed many Nigerians, are beginning to be more European than the Europeans. So we're changing lifestyle every single day, and this is causing a huge challenge on, on Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa, and indeed on breast cancer incidents in the country. Um, so this is a huge challenge that we're facing, and it's something we all have to address. Uh, but at Project Pink Blue, we are doing what we can, especially in awareness and also in providing medical oncology training and doing a bit of research for us to understand what is currently available and what needs to be done. So we all have to really think about the, what is exactly is the challenge that we are facing and how are we going to address it? And the challenge is clear to us. 
How we are going to address it is also clear to us. But are we committed? Do we have the willpower to make this commitment and match it with action for us to really be able to save our women who are dying every single day? You know, according to WHO, 26 Nigerian women die every single day from breast cancer. Yeah, so I will stop here for now. Ransi Chidebe, thank you. Uh, if Akure Skype is clear, uh, we would like to join Her Excellency uh, Mrs. Betty Ayanwo Akiridulu, who is joining us via Skype all the way from Akure. Uh, there she is. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, breast cancer specifically is real and uh, it can also be prevented. That's the story that you are telling, isn't it? I would like thank you for I think um, I will not just use that word readily. Um, given that uh, breast cancer has at the cellular level. So so if you say prevention and somebody will ask you, What am I going to do to prevent breast cancer and you are blank. You wouldn't know what to do. We need to educate our people, our women, to understand the that at cellular level, when a cell starts misbehaving, um, it growth can no longer be and that if it for time. So, yes, there is um, about. We do not have clear signal from uh, Akure, I'm afraid. Uh, we will have to work on that. Uh, while our technicians, uh, engineers, are working on it, Kinsley, I think let's also bring in our uh, guest who's just joined us here in Abuja. Gloria Oji is a cancer survivor. She has just joined us. Thank you very much, madam. And should I say congratulations? You want to share your story with us? Yes, I can do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, it started in 2010, precisely around um, June. I felt, a, actually in 2009, December, I felt a lump on my right breast and um, I was worried because it was. Were you constantly checking? You yes, I do. I, also, I always do self breast exam whenever I'm having my bath, actually. That's mm -hmm. how I do mine. So I was having my bath and I noticed it. So I went to the hospital, a private hospital, and then they asked me to do, go for mammogram, which was done. They said, yes, actually, that there is a lump. So I went, they asked that I go for um, a biopsy, and that was done. And then it came out and they said it was benign. So I was cool. Initially I was so scared, but I was cool. Then six months later in 2010, I started feeling another lump at the same place. And it didn't occur to me actually that it was a lump. I remember asking the doctor that, how long does it take for internal stitches to dissolve? And then um, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I just uh, removed lump from my breast and he's back again. And he said, come to the hospital. I went to the hospital. He said, wow, that this is even bigger than the first one. So he still said I should go for surgery, which it was removed. And that was the one that they declared malignant. So actually, it took six weeks for the results to come out because uh, then the National Hospital was on strike and that was when, where the specimen was taken to. So I did it in June, but the results came out in August and um, they gave me a referral. I should go back to National Hospital and then start my treatment. But I remember asking the doctor when he told me, Gloria, you have cancer. <laughs> I just, um, you know, it's just like turning 360 degrees. Everything about me went bad, bad and black and everything, you know. So I stopped thinking, you know, your hopes, your aspirations ceases at that moment. And I asked the doctor, doctor, how long do I have to live? And he said, who told you you're going to die? I was like, well, you don't have the cancer I do, so you can always, you know, try to make me feel good. So he referred me to National Hospital and I went 
and um, I went to the uh, SOPD, which was actually the department he referred me to because he said I was to do mastectomy. When I went to SOPD, the doctor there said no, that these days that they don't treat that way, that since it is still at an early stage that he wouldn't want me to go straight for mastectomy, that I should go to the oncology department and start with my treatments first. Then, in the course of the treatment, they would be able to determine how far the treatment has affected the lump so that they will now know what to do. And uh, I started the treatment. I went through the chemotherapy. <laughs> he actually is my doctor, Dr. Bela is my doctor. So. <laughs> He started with our chemotherapy. I did the six courses, but I need to say one thing. And um, National Hospital taught me a lot. I learned a lot because when you come early, there is this one-hour discussion or tutorial given to us by our caregiver. So it makes you you start having hope. Yes, so I was going to ask you how yes. did you overcome the first shock and yeah. then regain you know, inspiration to move on. Yes. So one, one, one of Al Hajimodi, I'll never forget him. He takes us every morning and he told us, look, cancer is like malaria. Malaria kills and cancer kills. People survive malaria and people survive cancer. So but what you need to do, these are the right things. Follow through your treatment. Forget about whatever they are telling you outside. You can survive cancer. So that actually gave me hope. And um, from one end of despair to, you know, hope, and I was like, okay, if this is what uh, he said, I, I believed. And then I started with my treatments. So I went through six courses of chemo. I, you always wonder of what to expect when you start chemo, your hair fall off, mm -hmm. you, oh my God. <laughs> It wasn't funny, but um, at the end of it all, since you actually know what to expect, it's easier. So when the hair starts... Uh, is, is, is chemo a continuous therapy? You take it, uh, it depends on the uh, number of courses that you're given. You, are, you take it once in three weeks. So like I was asked to do six courses. Some are given more than that, some less. So everything depends. Yeah. Yes, mm. So everything is okay with you now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm nine years as God will have it, and I'm still counting by His grace. Congratulations, Gloria. Thank you, sir. Right. We'll, we'll return to you shortly. Dr. Okay. Billow, don't smile yet. We're going to come back to you. <laughs> but congratulations also, Dr. Billow. I mean, it's always a, you know, a wonderful guest with us here uh, in terms of giving out information and with regard to what, what it does. But let's bring in now Honorable Dachung Musa Bagos, uh, who is a member of the House of Representatives. What's your interest in breast cancer? Ah, well, uh, it's a very difficult question if you really want to know. My interests in two forms. One, um, as a direct victim, whom uh, I lost my mom to breast cancer in 2016. I'm sure Dr. Bello have known. And secondly, as a representative of the people, whom on daily basis we have requests from the people on the um, issue of uh, health challenges um, uh, which involve uh, breast cancer. And as a National Assembly member and as a representative, virtually over 400 members are affected directly or indirectly. If you go to the floor of the House today, you find out um, a lot of members have lost their parents or relatives as a result of, uh, of cancer in general and especially breast cancer. So when we review uh, the issue of cancer in the country as members, a uh, few of us in the house uh, that were directly affected and uh, the discovery was not uh, palatable at all because I knew the challenges that we went through with my mom uh, from the University of Just Teaching Hospital down to Zaria, from Zaria to the National Hospital and as of then, about only two of those machines were working uh, in the country then. And, and you find out that you, you, we have to wake up like 4 a.m. to go and book uh, a space for her in the National Hospital just for her to come for her radiotherapy. So, so, so the case was not palatable at all. And when we checked that in Nigeria, 
with only seven centers and two were working then. And now, uh, well, we are happy that uh, the case have improved. But if you check the U.S., the U.S. have over 2,500 uh, radiotherapy machines, linear serrators, and about 65 for animals. But Nigeria have only five for human beings. <coughs> but in the one, U.S., they have functional. Yeah. One, eh? Four, 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 four functional. functional. Five, one in private. Yeah. Okay. But there's still a shortage of about 5,000 radiotherapy machines in the world. So, so, so that has really given us uh, serious concern as, uh, as representative of the people. So unanimously, we move a motion for the federal government to ensure that we have for now, we have at least one radio oncology center within the geopolitical zone. And I'm happy to tell you that um, the present budget defense, um, uh, it has been able to, uh, uh, to scale through, uh, through the Ministry of Health that uh, we will now have one oncology center in every geopolitical zone. I know it was so surprising that it's very expensive. Just to have an oncology center is uh, hundreds of millions. So, so, so it's something that uh, as representative of the people, we're going to channel resources to where uh, it's needed and where it will give the right, uh, uh, right resources and again feedback to the people, so which is very, very <coughs> important. But I can assure you that the damage and leaders that cancer has killed in this country, as far as I'm concerned from the statistics, even more than HIV. And um, if we all put our heads together, uh, the executive, the legislature, and even the people, just like uh, you're doing your own quarter now with, with awareness, will overcome the challenge. And my plea as representative that we from the National Assembly, we have done our bit. It's left for the executive to ensure releases of funds to the Ministry of Health to ensure that these oncology centers are established in the geo six geopolitical zones. And again, to the private uh, mm -hmm. sector, I'm sure government can do it alone. Uh, the recent radiotherapy machine that was given to National Hospital was donated by NNPC. So if we can have other donations like this in different hospitals, uh, it will go a long way. But because, uh, like Dr. Bello said earlier, the, the lifestyle uh, is seriously changing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. we, are go move, we, are, we, we take a lot of processed foods. We, we don't exercise. I have to look for how to start exercise every morning. You want to go out to even exercise every morning. You have security challenges. So, so a lot of issues that we need to uh, uh, have a holistic ar um, <coughs> arrangement around most of these issues. So, so I'm very positive that if we all move towards uh, cancer and breast cancer, we'll, we'll overcome the challenge. I wish that uh, it's my mother that is seated here giving the success story of her. But yeah. then... Uh, everybody has his own time and, and God knows why. But we are happy with your success story. And I'm sure that other women too will, that are listening in will have hope that there is hope. And want to commend Her Excellency and um, other state governor's wives for really uh, delving into this. Uh, because it's not easy to lose about 35 people every day on breast cancer. Mm. So it's something that... Uh, as a country, we need to come together to overcome uh, this. If developed world already are controlling the rate of deaths, uh, we can do it. We can do it. Honorable Bagos, uh, give us an insight into what the average cost is for setting up uh, a, cancer, a cancer center. Yeah, well, the, the experts will say, but we, what we appropriated, uh, I think it's uh, it's over a billion to have, because it's not just to have a machine, you have to, you have, to have a bunker uh, where uh, you will not have uh, radioactive waves that will come out. Even the people that are administering are in danger. <laughs> so, so, so it's a very serious uh, place that is just like having an atomic bomb that you're trying to uh, to prevent it from going out, nuclear weapon, and so on and so forth. So, 
So, so it's, it's a lot because when we saw the estimate, we say <laughs> just to have a machine and you're having, but um, experts now have to explain to us that it's not just having, it's not just buying the machine. You have to have a very serious bunker. You have to train personnel uh, in getting the machine. Just buying the machine is hundreds of millions and so on and so forth. So, so it ran into hundreds of millions. Of millions. To have that. I, I asked that question, Claire. Mm. I mean, because the point that uh, Bagos has raised and for the other guests, okay, we would know there's federal government intervention and we have also seen CSR as the corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. by the oil giant and NPC. And I saw that Dr. Sure, Bello sure. also saying yeah. Shell, mm -hmm. uh, probably joint venture, NNPC and Shell. Uh, is this something that is beyond the reach or beyond the competence or capability of state governments? Uh, if, if, you know, you appropriate for it over a period of time. I mean, if, if you were to have, let's say, one cancer uh, screening center or one cancer, no, sc screening is a, a cancer treatment center yeah. in each state of the federation. One. Go a long way. I one. think that, um, if I come here, yes. I think uh, this is the, my, what I feel that na if we look at the whole nation, Nigeria is a huge country. It's 160 million, 200 million, and uh, we're talking about that kind of population. The only way we can actually make a difference is if, if we start to look at Nigeria in, at the state level, in regions. The cost of building a reasonable treatment center, we're looking at nothing less than $500 million, US dollars. So $1 billion, that, $1 billion naira that they have put aside is not going to go very far in it will go do something but it's not going to build all those treatment centers that the the members want to build so if we can get the states to do their own bits or if the state starts to think about it that's the only way that we're going to have some impact in the country the federal government on its own cannot do it the funding partners shy away from doing things in nigeria because of our size. Of late countries like um, Senegal, Rwanda, um, Kenya have been in the news for instituting screening programs, for starting um, free treatments. Senegal was in the news. They're going to start giving um, free chemotherapy in their hospitals. <coughs> what is their population? They're not up to the size of a state in Nigeria. So, and if you look at the details of these um, interventions, they're from partners like the World Bank, and their governments are able to give counter counterpart funding, but it's not a huge amount. I was at a conference two weeks ago in Kazakhstan, and uh, one of the participants from Oman came up and said they have been able to increase their screening rates up to 85% in the last two years. And um, she spoke eloquently about how they did it and they're about to eliminate or they're about to have full screening coverage. And everybody was clapping. And in the course of her conversation, when she started mentioning her figures, she dropped the figure 23,000. <laughs> that is the size of a local government in Nigeria. <laughs> so they are able to do these things because of their population. The population of Nigeria is huge. We have to look at it in more holistic manner, holistic manner and in you know really try to look at it individually. That way we can make some. All right, Your yeah, Excellency, thank you. Let's uh, get the perspective from Her Excellency from Akure, uh, Mrs. Betty Anyangu Kerodulu. Uh, we're talking about um, the, the need for more oncology centers you know, to be set up across uh, all the geopolitical, uh, geopolitical zones in the country. But for you, uh, Your Excellency, what would be the most important burden for a cancer patient? Is it the cost, or cost, cost of treatment or access to quality treatment? Because even if you provide, if the centers are there, can a cancer patient afford treatment for the different stages of cancer? Thank you for having me. The next part hasn't been very, very good. The problem with treat, treating cancer, 
you cannot isolate one from the other. It has to be. Yes, some people will say it's um, the money. And again, accessibility to where you will get treatment. That's another issue. So, for us to be really serious to control cancer in this country, I share with uh, my sister, HEKB, that we should be looking at it at the state level. When, when a patient, a cancer patient, wants to access care, if the center is far removed from her, she has to deal with that barrier, distance barrier. It's a lot easier on her if that center is closer. Therefore, individual states should take up this responsibility seriously. And I see no reason why a state cannot. It's a matter of political will. And when you do that, there is the possibility that you improve on awareness of this disease. You improve on um, screening programs, which as of now, we don't have it. We need to have institutionalized screening. And here we've been advocating that we should even start with clinical breast exam. It's one of the uh, approach that they have recommended for low resource countries like Nigeria. We may not have the money to buy mammography machines and put in the hospital, but we can start with what we have, clinical breast examination, and that service should be provided to our women as the primary health care centers. We advocate for that seriously. It will go a long way in reducing late presentation, which is so rampant nationwide. It's not just in other states, all over the country. And in fact, that is what is killing our women is late presentation, because many of them do not know that breast cancer, if you present very late, there is very little you can do. So when you have such centers around you, definitely you're going to up awareness, you're going to up screening programs and so on. And with time, we begin to see a decrease in the late presentation. Of course, uh, it also goes in a, a data collection, which is so poor in this country. Your Excellency, thank you very much. Uh, the Skype got a bit clearer, incidentally, after I mentioned to my colleague that perhaps the metaphysical elements <laughs> were, were disturbing your, your contribution. But now we have some clarity from, uh, from our correct. Thanks, Lord. We'll return to you in the course of the conversation. You raised some points. Let's uh, bring in again Dr. Bello. Dr. Bello, uh, there are a number of interrelated issues. The number of uh, cancer screening centers. Some years ago, we were hearing that federal medical centers could also serve as cancer screening centers. Is that necessarily the case at the moment? I know you're not the Minister of Health, but is that necessarily the case at the moment? How many screening uh, centers do we have around the country? And then, second point, what are the symptoms, other than the lump arising from a physical, ex physical examination, that a person can feel and say, look, all right, let me go uh, to the hospital uh, and, and make a report. Is, is a lump a definitive uh, factor in ascertaining that, okay, this might be uh, some cancer, whether malignant or benign? You know, Kinsley, sorry, Dr. just so that you can lump up with Kinsley, because they are all maybe medical and technical questions. Okay. I, I know in, in my interactions with you sometimes, you, you mentioned in relation to Kinsley's question, what you call the BRCA genes, availability of that, and then why is it that these cells, you know, continue to, you know, uh, mutate? Why, why can't they be controlled? What are the triggers? 
So you've mm. asked like three questions? Yes, in addition to Kingsley's because First, Kingsley, you ask mm. about the screening. Centers, yes. Screening centers. Yes, um, it depends on what exactly you mean by screening. Okay, so for breast cancer, you see, we talk of mammography from the age of 35 in sub-Saharan Africa, but the standard guideline is 40 years. Um, we talk of uh, salt breast examination also as a screening method. We talk of clinical breast examination also as a screening method. So there are things that the woman herself can actually do. And there are things, clinical breast examination can be done by every doctor to ascertain if there are any of those symptoms that you have mentioned. It's not just lump that is there. You know, um, sometimes a woman will see some discharge, bloody discharge coming from the nipples. That may trigger the suspicion that that patient, that she could have breast cancer. Then you can see that the skin, even the skin of the breast, can allude to cancer. Sometimes the, 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 the skin becomes very thick and it looks like the back of an orange, you know, what is called powder orange. So that also is another thing. The other thing is retraction. Even the nipples can begin to retract, even though you have some normal physiological retracted nipples. How do you, mean, how do you mean retraction? So the, the nipples that are pointing yeah. begin to go inwards. So they are like pulled inside. So that is retraction, okay? So it moves, it's, it's like uh, folded in. Okay, so that may be a suspicion, you know, that the patient may have. Just, just go about this again for the benefit mm -hmm. of our viewers. Uh, one lump, probably. So, yeah. so lump is the number one thing that a patient, uh, a woman can actually feel, and that is why it's also important first the woman to know her own breast. But that monthly breast self examination, it she will know. There it's are people change. that have some, you know something like lumpy breast, but they are not really lumps. So by the time she's doing that, she'll be able to pick if there is any lump that is just coming up. Okay. That is the first thing. The second thing is that sometimes the lump may not necessarily be on the breast. It could be in the armpit, okay? So it could be in the armpit, what is called the lymph nodes. Okay, so that also may be a suspicion that she has breast, ca breast cancer. And I mentioned the discharge, bloody discharge, yeah. the skin colors, the size of the breast, sometimes it becomes bigger, and so on. And in doing self-breast examination, uh, one of the things that they do is they look at the breast. You know, they either stand up and hold their hands, and then they look at the levels of the nipples. If you see that one is way up mm. and bigger, then you need to go and do clinical breast examination in the hospital and all that. So that is basically about the... Mm, the screening. Yeah, the screening. So this is something that the patient, uh, the, the, the woman herself can do. Um, also, you can go to any hospital and do clinical breast examination. Mammography is a little bit more specific. And I do know that, yes, the, the medic aid can, um, mm. center does mammography and so many other, even private hospitals and government hospitals as well across the country. But the awareness to go and do it is very challenging because we are not going out to talk to our people that, look, you need to do this thing. So education is very critical. Our NGOs should be out there to talk to people about the importance of that screening. Now, they said early detection saves lives. I keep saying that it's not just about early detection. It has to be with early treatment. And that is where the problems that have been alluded to by the honorable me um, member here is very critical. We must provide treatment centers because by the time you have all the awareness, you have all the screenings, and then people are coming out in mass, and they have nowhere to go for treatment, mm -hmm. then it becomes very depressing. Recently, I heard over the NTA that the Central Bank of Nigeria is providing seven um, cancer diagnostic centers. If I have an opportunity, I will tell the, uh, the governor that, look, there is no need to have seven diagnostic centers. Let us have three, 
because it's a lot easier to have diagnostic centers. But let us also have four treatment centers because treatment is much more expensive. But Central Bank of Nigeria can do it. So if they can provide three diagnostic centers and four treatment centers, it will go a long way. Just before we take our short break, I'd like you to respond because she said after the first you know, treatment, the lump came back. Why do those you know, cells keep mutating? Why, why did it come back after the first treatment? <laughs> so so that's, that's a very difficult one to say. Um, you see, you did mention um, BRCA gene and uh, so some patients tend to have that BRCA gene and so when they do, the, the progression of that disease is much is so different, is much more aggressive as compared to those that don't have BRCA gene. That is one. Again, we do not, if, if we know the real causative agents, the real why do you even, uh, Mr., uh, Madam A will have breast cancer and Madam B will not have, even though they are all females. So there are so many things that are still going on. We say it's a genetic disease. So you cannot swallow um, breast uh, cancer cells and then they'll go and develop. So there are certain triggers that we are still looking at. What we call pathways, <coughs> signaling pathways and so on. It's a little bit complicated, complicated. why Doctor, it, her own came back. Dr. Bello, mm -hmm. uh, doctor, just, before, just before you come in, Honorable and Claire, and the other guests, Dr. Bello has uh, reminded us of what the Central Bank is promising to do, mm. uh, setting up uh, diagnostic centers. But he says, look, i uh, rather have a fewer diagnostic centers and then get treatment centers. Uh, I think that's a point that we need to uh, re-echo to the Central Bank of Nigeria. As part of your CSR, uh, we believe that you can uh, set up uh, a cancer treatment center. Uh, the NNPC and Shell have already made a donation to the National Hospital. So uh, CBN, you can have one. We also hope that the other agencies that are collecting revenue uh, will at some point take this up as a challenge. FROS. FROS, uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service, uh, Nigeria Customs Service, uh, listen to all of this because, I mean, uh, if people yes. are not well, you, there won't be trade, you won't have money to collect, you won't have revenue to collect, and perhaps also Nigeria Governors Forum, if they have the budget, Honorable okay. uh, no, but, 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 but really, the wives, the wives are, are stepping in. Honorable, please, let's mm. just take a short, a short break. break. Okay. When we come back, then we'll look at the other aspects of uh, treatment and management. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria. We'll be right back. And I said, good morning, Nigeria. I'm live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We have a number of tweets that have come in. Claire and I will quickly go through them and then we'll return to our guests. Uh, Prince Vicade has this tweet. Now, treatment of any type of cancer costs a lot of money, and I feel there should be provision by the federal government for free cancer treatment in order to save lives. Again, cosmetics and many other strange habits also aid its spread. To reduce the effect of breast cancer, the federal government should endeavor to establish cancer institute that will cater specifically for breast cancer. All right, and Reverend Manny Akban tweets, uh, the key to tackling this killer disease is early detection and intervention. A lot of women are still in the dark about breast cancer, especially in the rural areas. Therefore, more awareness and advocacy is needed to curb the menace. Francis will be proper awareness, uh, such as what has been done on the use of uh, sanitary towers and by the wives of governors and the president should champion this. Uh, but most especially, free screening should be carried out for rural women regularly. All right, and Dele Jack Solomon has a number of uh, uh, suggestions on what women can do to reduce the risk of breast cancer, some of which, of course, have been advocated. Uh, monthly self-checks, uh, avoiding uh, to tobacco, breastfeeding for at least one year, uh, of course, and regular exercise. He is also saying early diagnosis and prompt treatment will lead to overall reduction in breast cancer. He calls on Nigeria Ministry, uh, Ministry of Health to continue to partner with uh, all other in both uh, domestic and international organizations to ensure that cancer treatment services are available and increase awareness towards increased access. Again, increased access in all states of the Federation. Now, uh, Ishaq Abdullahi tweets, do men have breast cancer? The answer is yes, men can have breast cancer. The experts have said that. What are the early symptoms of uh, breast cancer in men? Well, 
I believe uh, Dr. Bello will respond to that, but it's already given some indications mm -hmm. of what the signs are. I'm, it's the same. It's the same. Well, yeah. I, I understand mm -hmm. that it's the same, mm -hmm. uh, virtually. Uh, are men also subjected to the same treatment? Yes. yes. All right. The answer from the experts is yes. All right. I guess Le Abbas Abaka Saad has also given his own suggestions on how you know breast cancer can be managed. So I think you'll get to the next one. All right. Uh, this is coming from Law Alpha C. Law Alpha C says women who are desirous of living long should not experiment with their breasts in order to uh, attract, in order to enhance their appeal. Thorough medical examination is germane to ascertaining health status. Okay, uh, Claire, mm. you know, that's uh, Mike Ayanko, Festus Akimboyawa, and DWH Nigeria, all those things are there. Now, DWH has this, which is a bit uh, interesting. It says, having the services of community health professionals with skills in psychology would go a long way in assuring the patients of sustainability of some of the treatments. I think Gloria was speaking about that, mm, yeah. uh, to say that breast, yes. uh, breast cancer or in, shall I say any form of cancer isn't necessarily a death sentence? Is that correct? Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. okay. That's, that's what the doctor said. All right. Please keep uh, your tweets coming in. It's good morning, Nigeria. Let's quickly take uh, uh, Runsi Chidebe, who also is joining us from Birmingham City in the UK uh, via Skype. Now, most cancer patients, you know, access treatment, of course out of pocket that means they pay you know uh, themselves and cost is one of the highest burdens most of them can't afford cost how would you suggest or what do you think what is the financial uh, model you will prescribe you know to ensure that patients access you know affordable uh, treatment and care okay um, thank you very much for this very important question as it relates to the financial burden of cancer. And I just wanted to say that um, cancer generally, breast cancer all over the world is very expensive. So it's not just expensive only in Nigeria or in Africa or in anywhere. Even in the UK here, it's also very expensive. Uh, but um, the only challenge why, why it's a huge burden for so many Nigerian patients is because um, we don't have insurance coverage for a greater percentage of the population. And for that reason, it makes it extremely difficult for people to really fund cancer care. One major strategy that I've seen that have worked in so many communities or in so many countries that we could try to really model is to try to see if we can use some innovative funding or innovative financing to support people who are indigent. For instance, uh, last year, there was a funding that we all advocated, which is called the Catastrophic Health Financing. That, uh, this same um, fund was brought up yesterday at the Senate hearing on Health Committee. And we had a serious advocacy to see how we can increase Uh, all right, yeah, that's uh, again another challenge there uh, from uh, Ron C. That, that funding was successful. Uh, yeah. and the, uh, all right, um, so let, very quickly, let's let's return to the studios, uh, Dr. Zena. I think that, that a group of advocates came together. Project Pink Blue, uh, Medicaid was involved, healthcare, uh, some pharmaceutical fund uh, as uh, companies. Quite a lot of people have been working for about three years to try and get um, a special funding for indigent cancer patients. A whole proposal was done about it and there was a hearing at the house yesterday and um, I, it was lucky, thankfully, it scaled through and the House Committee on Health, the Senate Committee on Health have accepted it. Uh, it wasn't in the budget line, but thankfully to the legislators, they have included it in the budget now and there is going to be a special uh, budget for indigent cancer patients. It initially is going to be to the tune of about one billion and then hopefully it will be increased from there. But of course this has to go through mm. the, from, from the from a, again a lay a lay person you know innovative funding mechanisms. Uh, models or mechanisms. Mm. From a, a layman's point of view, 
if you have a cancer treatment center, will that center be available to treat all forms of cancer? Or you will, different forms of cancer will require different treatment centers? Dr. Bello. So um, what is actually obtained in most of the civilized world is comprehensive cancer centers. And what that, that means is that you have diagnostic components, everything including images, including um, pathology, and so on. Everything surrounding diagnostic is there. Your MRIs, your CT scanners, your PET CT scan, and so on and so forth. Then you have the surgical management, where you have not just general surgeon, you will also have an ENT oncology surgeon. You have a urologist who is trained in surgical um, in oncology management and so on and so forth. Then you also have the medical oncology department. So it will treat each and every cancer. Um, the National Cancer Institute in Cairo, I was there to, um, about four months ago for two months. Um, they have different departments but they treat each and every cancer that is on the ground. And they have all these facilities that I've mentioned, and they've been doing it for the last 50, 80 years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a pity that this country, somebody but was mentioning... They specialize in the ones that are more rampant yes, in the area. Absolutely. So there are centers yes. where there are some rare cancers where you would have to go. Understandably, maybe thyroid cancer would be concentrated more in the areas that okay. are... Where it's concentrated, that are, mm -hmm. that are more prone to mm -hmm. it, exactly. Okay, Kissy, let me bring. I, I just want to mention about the Nigerian NHIS, Nigerian Health Insurance Scheme, as okay. well, which um, up until recently was is, right up till now does not cover um, cancer, cancer treatment. treatment for patients. But they have just agreed again through a lot of high-level advocacy from civil society oh, and cancer patients have agreed to bring on board some cancer care, such as cancer testing, uh, some surgeries, and also some form of chemotherapy. So I think this is a step in the right direction. They have not given us the full details yet, but if we keep mentioning it on fora like this, they're listening, they know they're under pressure, they have to give us the plan, the actual plan soon, and tell us exactly what they will cover. You know, you know uh, uh, I've, I've had calls to interact with and Dr. Bello here, you know, other people who are providing some form of support for cancer patients. And, and one of the questions I, I, give, I, give, I ask is, I, I try to evaluate our success with HIV. Uh, I think with HIV, we're able to mainstream screening you know, in, in the healthcare issue. So if we're a woman, you go to a, a public, uh, you know, I mean, you know, HIV yeah, is so infectious. The world was interested in HIV. I have a conspiracy yes, can't theory. We People are not going to catch cancer. It is not infectious. If I go to the UK, I'm not going to give anybody my cancer. So they're not interested in my cancer. You know, mm. I, I have to deal with it in my country. I, so th yeah. that's just it. My, my, my but we got a lot of funding and help on awareness, on treatment, on diagnosis, everything with HIV, it was attacked. The treatment, the cost of treatment, mm. of HIV treatment was crashed. The pharmaceutical company, they've not done that with cancer mm. treatment drugs. Yes, that's what, I'm, but that's what I'm saying. My, my question it's is, wouldn't it have been better to mainstream screening in our, in our, in our public uh, uh, health centers? We centers. have to do it ourselves because mm. it is our problem. It is everybody's problem. So we have to do it ourselves. And the government has to do it. The private sector has to do it. The people have to do it. We have to accept it exists. And we have to do it for ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so uh, you, you uh, remember uh, last uh, year that the Federal Minister of Health launched the National Cancer Control Plan. And part of that plan is to institutionalize screening process. But it's the, the whole document includes not only screening, diagnostic and treatment and so on. So it's to implement it will cost about 97 billion naira in the next five years. So this is something that is quite huge. All right, Honorable Bagos. Uh, Bago. Apart from uh, what Her Excellency said, and even Her Excellency in Ondo, the truth of the matter, everything here is, yes, this is our problem, we have to deal with it. And everything bounds back on political will. If those in the hands of affairs are ready and willing. We are the National Assembly, we are ready and willing. We have already appropriated uh, funding and some funds towards the cancer. I think in, in 2020 budget, 
for the treatment and provision of uh, centers and every, in total it's taking almost over 10 billion to tell you how serious we have taken it uh, as a representative of the people so the political will now is left for the executive to ensure uh, adequate and timely releases to uh, to the right institutions we have done our part and in terms of uh, awareness serious awareness from what uh, the governor's wives are doing and again to the governor's wives uh, you know th this is, is a, an issue that affects women more so you need a lot and much more advocacy especially to the governors and they are the ones that can appropriate and make sure that there's an appropriation for uh, for such cancer issues within uh, every state i'm sure even if they don't do it publicly and if they do it in the other room, they will really get results out of their husbands. And again, to Dr. Bello, and instill their awareness. To me, when we, we when the issue of midwifery started, and uh, you know, we have to go down to the villages to talk to other women, even those that are not nurses, <clears throat> to ensure that child uh, birth and so on and so forth. So we have to look at cultural and religious issues in terms of uh, this awareness. There are men culturally and religiously they say, no, I can't allow a doctor to go and examine the breast of my wife. So why can't the men come into it? Why can't you take the men an awareness that ah, this is my wife, I can easily examine my wife and if I notice what the doctor, I would believe the man will believe more on what the doctor tells him. Mm. So at, I think at, the men... At close proximity. Yeah, so, so the men should be involved in, 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 in the awareness because because culturally, religiously, yeah, some yeah, men will, will not have, allow... Have obstacles, yeah. yeah. will not allow okay. the doctors... Yeah, we will have that. obstacles, but interestingly, yeah. Honorable Bagos, we are also having many more women physicians now mm -hmm. uh, who are in practice, and so it's a lot easier to break that. But the imperative of uh, exposing uh, both men and women to uh, enlightenment is, is noted. Uh, Gloria, back, back to you again. What, what's, what's your, unfortunately we get pressed for time very easily when we have an interesting conversation such as this. What is your message to uh, women out there who either have breast cancer already or are likely to suffer from it or are undergoing treatment? Or are hiding away. Precisely. And saying that not my portion. <laughs> I want to tell um, women out there, not just women, everyone, cancer affects and affects everyone in the family. It impoverishes you, whether you like it or not. Unless you're the nouveau, the rich, the bourgeois, you can go out. To do it. So, but if you're the typical average Nigerian, you can't afford the treatment of cancer. Mm -hmm. So whether you like it or not, it's going to affect you. You definitely have to call your uncle or you definitely have to call a friend. And at times, your friend or your uncle will stop picking your calls because they feel ah, you've become a burden. So if things are done rightly initially, and that is where the early detection issue comes in, is the treatment is going to be cheaper. It will be cheaper. But even after that, I think the average treatment they, pro, they, they, they talked about was about three point something million. Averagely, some are more than that. Mm -hmm. So three point something million. So we should get to know more about cancer. We ladies should also know ourselves. Listen to your body and what your body is telling you. Mm -hmm. Nobody outside is going to do that for you. Okay, Gloria, thank you. Um, Dr. Bello, what, where do we go from here? Well, it's important to recognize that cancer is preventable. Some cancers are preventable. Know your lifestyles and change the ones that are, um, are risk factors to uh, cancers. Uh, know also that cancer is curable if it is detected early and treated promptly. And know also that all cancers can be treated at any stage. All right. I'd like to ask Mrs. Bergudu, you have a march, uh, a walk tomorrow, Cancer Awareness Yes, walk we tomorrow. do. It's the biggest event that, uh, mm -hmm. of, at this so, point of my life. Br briefly tell us, what, what's your goal? What would you, what are your expected outcomes? 
Uh, it's a phenomenal event that raises a lot of awareness. Um, it creates awareness, ju not just in Abuja, internationally. Uh, it's, host it's held in various countries across continents. The work is going to hold in London, in Houston, in Germany, in Turkey, in Abuja, in Maiduguri, in Lagos. Uh, we raise funds, we create awareness, we educate people, we push policymakers to make decisions about cancer. And that is the aim of the walk. We hope that you will join us tomorrow. And, um, we and, and Your Excellency, you didn't tell them that you are also the director of the UICC. Yes, I sit the on the first, board of the, the UICC. Uh, yes, but the I first the African board. actually to be so elected. Right, let, 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 let me quit. Let's, 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 let's quickly let's take our, our response, our five closing places. comments from Mrs. Akere Dulu uh, in Akure. Uh, your Excellency, uh, all right, uh, all right, um, we're expecting Mrs. Uh, uh, Akere Dolina Kure, quickly tell us, Ma, what um, your closing shots um, uh, so far from your experience? Um, I, I want to quickly say that I want to quickly say that if we are, if we want to be serious about controlling cancer or breast cancer in this country, we have to invest in awareness and screening these are the entry points to reduce this alarming rate um, of death due to breast cancer and of course what led to it has always been that presentation if reduce it then start from the basic and government has to invest in this area, build alliance with NGOs. Yeah. Oh dear, that, uh, that's our Skype connection going off now. We must have uh, appreciated His uh, Excellency, Mrs. Betty Ayanwa Kerodulu, wife of the Undo State Governor, for joining us via Skype from Akura. Thank you. We also want to appreciate uh, uh, Runche Chidebe from uh, Birmingham City, who's joined us via Skype. Thank you very much, uh, Runche. And uh, back here in Abuja, let me also appreciate Dr. Zainab Shinkafi, Bagudu, wife of the Kebbi State Governor, a pediatrician and founder of NGO Medicaid Cancer. Thank you. Member, yes. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. <laughs> Belu Abubakar Mohammed, Chief Consultant, Clinical and Radiation Oncologist. Thank you. Uh, Thank Honorable you. Dachang Musa Bagos, member of the House of Representatives. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Gloria. Uh, Oji, thank you very much for finding time to join us. A good morning, Nigeria. All right. All right. Claire, that does it. Claire, yeah. yeah, just before we say that does it for that topic, just to remind uh, the, cent here. the Central Bank of Nigeria, <laughs> which is desirous of uh, setting up seven cancer diagnostic yeah. centers. The expert here on Group One Nigeria today, Dr. Bello, so the National Hospital says, we don't need at this time seven diagnostic centers, probably three. What we need cancer treatment centers. Yeah. If you can get one, that would be fantastic. Yeah. FRS could also contribute. Yeah. Uh, Nigerian Custom Service yeah. could also have theirs. And indeed, all the banks that are declaring huge profits could also have theirs. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that does it for our conversation on breast cancer management. Sports is next. Let's go over now to our sports desk. <laughs>